It is very good to be back here, and thank you all for coming on such a wonderful day, when I'm sure you would all prefer to be outside. I need to begin by explaining how drones work. And most of what I have to say is about the way in which the United States uses drones. But you will soon see that many other states use the same technology. A drone can be this size. In five years' time, a drone can be that size. In 10 years' time, it can be that size. But the drones that we're talking about are about this size. These are aircraft which can be flown without anybody on board or inside. That's true of the small ones, obviously, unless you're really, really small. But it's also true of the big ones. These drones are flown from bases in the United States, here. And they use a satellite to send signals from the pilots and the observers on the ground to the aircraft thousands and thousands of miles away. But they also send signals back to the pilots and the observers on the ground. So here we have the base in the United States, Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And you can see that it's connected by a fiber optic cable to a station in Germany. And from that station up to a satellite, and from the satellite down to a predator or a reaper. Those are the names of the drones patrolling Afghanistan, and as you'll see soon, Pakistan. But you can see too that if you reverse that, video comes back from the drone to the United States. Because obviously, if you're flying an aircraft thousands and thousands of miles away, you need to be able to see what the drone is seeing. This is the sort of image that one of those drones was capable of providing in 2005. And you can see that the scale can come down and down and down. Now that was in 2005. Now, these feeds, full motion, high resolution video, are much, much sharper and much more precise. And those video feeds are important because they're transmitted not just to the pilot, but to many other people across a network. Most importantly, those same video feeds are shown on screens here at the command center for US Central Command in the state of Qatar. And there you find senior officers, but you also find military lawyers and analysts who are looking at those same video feeds and who are in command of a mission which is being flown by those pilots back in Nevada. Those video feeds also go to video analysts. Back in the United States, who look at those videos and search for clues, trying to understand the landscape and the people who appear on those screens. 
Now, all of that is important because it means, firstly, that a drone is often described as an unmanned aircraft. Well, it's true. There is nobody inside the drone. But you can see that there are hundreds of people involved in each one of those missions. The pilot and the observer flying the aircraft, but then all of those watching the video feeds at the airbase in Qatar and all those video analysts across the United States. But the second reason this is important is that most of these aircraft now carry not just cameras, but also missiles and bombs. This is an advertisement from an American company which manufactures drones. Dwell, detect, destroy. What they're saying there is that the drone can remain on station flying very, very slowly for 24, for 36 hours. All you have to do to keep it there is to change the pilots on the ground in Nevada. So the aircraft stays even as the pilots change. That's dwell. Detect, because with those video feeds and with other sensors, it's possible for all of those observing, recording, monitoring what's happening to detect members of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the enemy. But destroy, because these aircraft can also fire missiles. I should tell you that most of the time they don't. Only 5% of airstrikes in Afghanistan are carried out directly by drones. But the feeds from those drones are used by the pilots of other ordinary aircraft to come in and drop their bombs to send their missiles to the target. The reason that drones are so important is, well, firstly, they're much cheaper than a conventional aircraft. Secondly, very few people involved in the operation are at risk, are in danger, because most of them are not in Afghanistan at all. They're in Qatar. They're even in the United States. But they're also attractive because they speed up the whole process of war. And the United States Air Force says that what it aims to do is to be able to identify a target on a video screen, to confirm that you've got the right target, to have all the mission commanders and all the lawyers in Qatar agree that this is legal, and then to strike the target with a missile. All of that in under two minutes. Now, if you think about bombing in the Second World War, it could take weeks and months to plan a bombing mission. Of course, you'd be bombing whole areas of cities. In Vietnam, in the 1960s and 1970s, it could take weeks or days to plan a bombing mission. But of course, you'd be bombing vast boxes over the rainforest. Here, they want the whole exercise to be completed, not in months, not in weeks, not in days, but in minutes. And increasingly, the target is an individual. This is a video stream, which you can find on YouTube, showing the video from one of those drones and ultimately the missile being fired at individuals. Now this is a dramatic change in how war is fought. And it can very easily lead to mistakes. Now we're not talking about destroying Dresden. 
We're not talking about B-52 bombers carpet bombing Vietnam. But I don't think that Dresden or Vietnam is the moral standard to which we should hold ourselves. So this is an example of what can happen. Taken from Afghanistan in February 2010, a small group of American special forces were moving towards a village when several miles away, a drone detected three trucks moving in the direction of the village. And the drone, the predator, tracked those trucks for hours. Now this is the landscape, at least the map of the operation. And I have, through a Freedom of Information Act request, a detailed transcript of everything that took place. Now you need to understand Maybe you need to understand. <laughs> now we'll do it with the music. The, what I have here are the records of all of those people in the network talking to one another. They're all watching those video feeds. They're talking over the radio, but they're also in chat rooms on the web. Now I won't work through this in any detail, but I'm showing you the screen so that you have a sense of the detail. What this shows you is that back in the United States, the pilot flying the drone and his observer are struggling to make sense of what they see on the screen. They have no real idea what it is. All they can see are three trucks driving through a landscape. They're also in close contact with the commander of those troops on the ground. And so they keep asking one another, what is that? What are they doing? What are we seeing? At every single moment, they interpret everything they see as hostile. Everything they see leads them to believe that this is the Taliban. So here, they identify a possible weapon. Now this possible weapon could be anything. It could be a box. And in Afghanistan, many people carry weapons after all. We're not members of the Taliban. But look who's carrying it. A military-aged male. Not a young kid. Not a boy who's 15 or 16. But a military-aged male. They get very cross at one moment because one of the analysts claims to have seen a child among the passengers in the trucks. And they get very cross because back in the United States, somebody has seen a child, but they're not so quick to see the rifle, to see the weapon. At one point, the convoy stops. Everyone on the trucks gets out to pray. This is Afghanistan. What do the observers in the United States say? Praying? I mean, seriously, that's what they do. In other words, if they're praying, it's not that they're Muslim, it's they must be Taliban. That's what they do. This is definitely it. They're going to do something nefarious, evil. 
So they continue backwards and forwards with this conversation, trying to work out what they are. <clears throat> the Predator doesn't have enough missiles to carry out a strike on the three trucks. So two combat helicopters are called in. Helicopters with missiles. But they still have one missile left on the Predator. And so the pilot says, as long as you keep somebody we can shoot in the field of view, I'm happy. The helicopters come in, they release their missiles. Silence. Laughter. Silence. These are the strikes. Seen from the Predator, from the drone, but carried out by helicopters. Silence. Those lumps, says the observer in the United States, are probably all people. And then they look closer. Women and children. This was the scene on the ground. In fact, everyone that was killed was a civilian with no connection with the Taliban whatsoever. Now, how can that happen? It happens, I think, because a drone with these high-resolution, full-motion video feeds makes all of those watching feel that they're there. They're part of the action. But the only communication they have is with their own troops on the ground. And they feel a responsibility to protect their troops, which is why they interpret everything they see as hostile. If they carry a rifle, it doesn't mean they're the Taliban, but that's what they say. If they're praying, it obviously doesn't mean they're Taliban, but that's what they say. So what this means is that this new technology contracts the distance between the United States and Afghanistan. When you talk to people who carry out these missions, they say they're not seven and a half thousand miles away. They're 18 inches away, the distance from the eye to the screen. They feel that they're there. But they're there, not with the people of Afghanistan, but with the troops on the ground. Now, most uses of drones by the US military are like that. They're used to support troops on the ground. And very often, the attack is carried out by other aircraft. But the use of drones that most people know about is really very different. You're still going after individuals, but named individuals who are on a list. This is targeted killing. Now, targeted killing has a very long history. In its modern form, it's the state of Israel, which began the whole process of targeted killing. In November 2000, during the Second Intifada, Israel became the first state in the world to officially announce it had a policy of targeted killing, identifying people you plan to kill, Palestinians, and then killing them. This isn't anonymous killing on a battlefield. This is killing named individuals. Israel is also one of the pioneers of drone technology. It's the second largest manufacturer of drones in the world, and it's the largest exporter of drones in the world. And drones started to be used by Israel for the process of targeted killing in 2008. Most recently, in the targeted killing, of the military chief of Hamas, 
and Israel posted this video on YouTube, which also tells you something about war today. And these visual images which are used not just to kill, but then to tell the world that you have killed. And drones are continually in the sky over Gaza and elsewhere. But it's the United States that has pushed the use of drones for targeted killing to the limit. Now I'm going to be talking mainly about the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. But you need to understand that the US military, the US Air Force, is also involved in targeted killing. So here we have a meeting of a military targeting group every week in Afghanistan. And the military, the army meet to decide which named individuals they want to kill. And that meeting is attended by all sorts of people and if you look at all the letters, at the very end, there's O-G-A, which means Other Government Agency, which is the CIA. So although the military carries out killing and has its own target list, it works very closely with the CIA. And it was the CIA which first started to use drones, not the Air Force. The CIA flew them over the Balkans from the mid-1990s. When they were first armed with missiles, that was for the CIA. And the first use of the system to support troops on the ground in Afghanistan was by the CIA. And they first used drones for targeted killing in November 2002, that's six years before Israel. Now this whole program, directed by the CIA, codenamed Sylvan Magnolia, was directed at what they called high-value targets, the really important people. And the first CIA-directed killing in Pakistan was of this man, Nek Mohammed, in June 2004. But for the first few years, 2004 to 2008, there were very few targeted killings until President Bush in 2008 agreed to increase their number. When President Obama came to office in 2009, he increased the number even more, and again in 2010. Now, why should Obama be so interested in using drones to kill members of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda? The answer is simple. Until Obama came to power, most of the effort of the CIA and of the military was in capturing members of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban on the battlefield and sending them to Guantanamo Bay or to black sites around the world. Capture them. And we know a great deal about the way in which the CIA carried out what it called extraordinary rendition. Capturing people and sending them around the world. But in 2009, the newly elected President Obama stopped that program. Guantanamo Bay, remember, was going to be closed. All of those black sites in Europe were going to be closed. The CIA could no longer capture, put in prison, and torture people. So, said the CIA, what do you expect us to do with them? The answer, kill them. <coughs> According to the then director of the CIA, drone strikes are the only game in town the only way left to attack Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. 
And this whole program is managed from the Counter-Terrorism Center in Langley, Virginia, in which detailed lists are drawn up, in which lawyers look at the lists, look at the evidence, and then recommend to the president that those people be put on the list for killing. If you want to listen to somebody's telephone in the United States, you have to go to a judge with forms, with paper, 30, 40, 50 pages to listen to somebody's telephone. If you're in the CIA and you want to kill somebody, it just takes two pages. This is the man who signed off on each of those folders. How many law professors have signed off on a death warrant, he asks. This is how the whole process works. This is the office in which it takes place. And over the years, the names on those lists have gone beyond Al-Qaeda, beyond even the Taliban, to those supposedly linked to them in some way, like drug traffickers. Targets have gone even beyond named individuals, people whose name you know, and they've been extended to people behaving suspiciously. These are called signature strikes. And since 2008, when the number of attacks has gone up, most reports estimate that the CIA has killed around 12 times more ordinary low-level fighters than even mid, medium, or high-level ranking leaders. And of course, there's a huge debate on how many civilians have been killed during that process. But nonetheless, the United States is persuaded, in the words of John Nagel, that we're getting so good at various electronic means of identifying, tracking, locating members of the insurgency, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, that we've created this almost industrial scale killing machine. So if drones are used on the battlefield in Afghanistan to support troops on the ground, if the CIA has started to use drones to develop this great industrial scale killing machine, where is it doing the killing? And you see, the geography of this matters. And that's really what I want to show you this afternoon. Last month, this image appeared all over the web. It records all of the drone strikes in Pakistan by the United States from 2004 through to the present. And down below are the number of people killed. And it's a diagram called Out of Sight, S-I-G-H-T. And I've tried to show you that the whole logic of killing using drones depends on vision, depends on what you can see. And their argument is that most people don't worry about all those people being killed in Pakistan because it's thousands and thousands of miles away. But I also think that it's out of sight, in the English language sense, meaning of place. Because what we forget is the geography of these strikes. And so let me explain why these strikes take place where they do, across the border from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Now the border itself isn't a line. Of course, it's a line on a map. But if you go to the landscape, it's a vast gray zone. It was a line which was drawn on the map by the British at the end of the 19th century. The so-called Durand line, drawn by Henry Durand, 
to separate Afghanistan from British India. But it was a line which was drawn on a map. Those who drew that line knew nothing about the landscape or the people. And it divided cultural groups who had a great deal in common. They spoke the same language. They had the same customs. They married across the line. They traded across the line. And that alone, I suppose, means that it's not surprising that if you plot political violence in Afghanistan and Pakistan, it clusters along that line. Those fighting in Afghanistan cross into Pakistan and then back again to fight in the spring when the war resumes. And there are all sorts of ways in which that line on the map dissolves, disappears. As I've said, the Taliban operate on both sides of the line, though in different ways. We know too that the United States depends upon ground lines of communication through Pakistan to receive its military supplies into Afghanistan. And we know that those convoys are routinely attacked. We know that the Taliban depend upon drug trafficking to support part of their war. And those drugs find their way to market across the border, the opium poppy moving across the border through Pakistan to Karachi and beyond. Even something like disease, in this case polio, spreads across the border and the Taliban works to ban polio vaccinations until the US stops its drone attacks. So there are all kinds of ways, you see, in which even today, that line on the map doesn't mean anything. Everything is crossing that line backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. It turns out, too, that the US doesn't really recognize that border either. When the United States talks about the war in Afghanistan, it talks not about Afghanistan, but about AFPAC, Afghanistan, Pakistan, a term proposed by Richard Holbrook. But the CIA doesn't call it that at all. At its counterterrorism center, it has a Pakistan, Afghanistan department. And for the CIA, the real war isn't in Afghanistan at all. It's in Pakistan. And the primary target of these lands, the federally administered tribal areas, just across the border from Afghanistan. But what's so interesting about those lands is that the Pakistan state has an unusual relationship to them. These are areas created by the British even before they drew the line on the map. These are areas which are controlled directly by the president <coughs> of Pakistan. No law passed by the Pakistan parliament applies to these regions unless the president says so. They have their own separate legal system. Until last year, no political parties could organize in these lands. It's an area then subject to the direct rule and control of the president of Pakistan. All powers and responsibilities of the state are placed under the direct control of the president. And it's all administered through a system of agents. So this is far from being a democratic space. And all of those regulations, which we can trace back to the British in the 19th century, have been reinforced by a series of contemporary laws 
like the actions in aid of civil power regulations, which effectively allows the army to impose martial law, military law, on these lands. So they're a strange space, they're an exceptional space. They're not part of the rest of Pakistan. They're governed separately. And yet, across the border, the war rages in Afghanistan. Now what can we say about the airstrikes, about the drone strikes in that region? Well, not surprisingly, they have a very long history. The British drew those lines on the map because they knew that they faced trouble in those lands. The British imposed that strange system of law because they knew they faced trouble in those lands. And in the 1920s and the 1930s, Britain used aircraft to bomb those lands. Not surprisingly, there were those who realized that the policy was a failure. By driving people from their homes, by destroying their lives, all the British managed to do was make the situation worse. That was true in the 1920s and 30s, and there are good reasons to suppose that that's true today as well. So these are the aircraft which were being used to bomb these lands by the British in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now today, as I said 20 minutes or so ago, the bombing is carried out partly by the United States using drones. And you can see the numbers of strikes increasing, though recently they've caused fewer and fewer civilian casualties. They seem to be getting more accurate. And it may be that that's because the United States is now able to be more precise, that it's prepared to limit the number of casualties. But we can map these strikes. That's the overall pattern of strike, but we can build them up. The end of December 2011, 2012. Now when you look at those maps, what you find is that these drone strikes have been concentrated in two areas, North Waziristan and South Waziristan, in the tribal areas. But what you can't see from those maps, and what you would never know from reading the newspapers, is that other people are bombing the tribal areas. I said the British were bombing them in the 20s and 30s, so they were. I said the United States has been bombing them from 2004, focusing on North and South Waziristan. But what you would never know is that the Pakistan Air Force is also bombing those areas. This is from the Pakistan Air Force's own calendar, showing the Air Force bombing the tribal areas. Bombing, you might think, its own people. Figures are hard to come by, but we do know that between May 2008 and November 2011, the Pakistan Air Force carried out 5,000 strike sorties inside Pakistan, inside those tribal areas. It dropped 11,600 bombs on 4,600 targets. Now, please understand that's greater than anything the United States has done in the tribal areas. I don't say that to defend the United States, I simply say that so that you have an understanding that the United States is not alone. This is just a listing of strikes from December 2012 to March 2013, carried out by the Pakistan Air Force in the tribal areas. Kills 10, kills 29, kills 8, kills 9, kills 8, kills 23. That's just in a matter of months. 
And of course, just like the United States, the Pakistan Air Force insists that no civilians were killed in any of those attacks. Now we do know that in the early years of the campaign, many of those attacks were wildly inaccurate. Pakistan's aircraft were old and poorly equipped. But since then, they've been radically improved. There have been all sorts of investments in new aircraft and the Pakistan Air Force has its own drones there at the top, carrying out surveillance of the tribal areas. So there's something strange going on, isn't there, when both the United States and Pakistan are bombing the tribal areas. Remember those lands which have this strange status, this exceptional status as not really being part of Pakistan. Now very recently the United Nations Special Envoy has claimed that Pakistan has nothing to do with those American drone strikes. The government of Pakistan is quite clear, it does not consent, it does not agree to the use of drones by the United States on its territory. And of course the government of Pakistan has protested the use of those drones again and again and again. And in fact, the United Nations Special Envoy said he was given assurances that there was no tacit, no unspoken consent by Pakistan to the use of drones on his territory. A thorough search of Pakistani government records had revealed no sign of Pakistan ever agreeing to the United States carrying out these attacks. Well, they didn't look very far. The first strike, I said, carried out by a US drone in Pakistan was against Net Mohammed in 2004. That was a deal agreed explicitly between the government of the United States and the government of Pakistan. The United States had no great interest in Net Mohammed but he was becoming increasingly a problem for the Pakistan government. And so, the United States agreed to kill that man on condition that the Pakistan government would give them access to the tribal areas. The Pakistan government agreed. They wanted to be able to limit the strikes to two areas, North and South Waziristan. So you see, the reason for that geography, the reason those strikes are limited to North and South Waziristan is because the government of Pakistan wanted them limited to those areas. President at the time, Musharraf, didn't think there'd be any difficulty in carrying out this deception because he said in Pakistan things fall out of the sky all the time. Things haven't changed much. Remember the United Nations envoy was told a thorough search of government records could find no trace that Pakistan had ever agreed to the use of these drones. Well, thank God for WikiLeaks. On the 21st of August 2008, the US ambassador in Islamabad reported that the new prime minister Yusuf Raza Gilani had endorsed the program of drone strikes. I don't care if they do it as long as they get the right people, he said. We'll protest it in the National Assembly and then ignore it. In fact, CIA directed drones have been launched from six bases inside Pakistan. They've agreed to focus, as I say, on North and South Waziristan. The CIA sends a fax about once a month to Pakistan outlining where the attacks are going to take place. Now what's interesting is what happened on the 19th of November 2008 when for the very first time an attack was launched by the United States outside the tribal areas, outside North and South Waziristan. 
Five militants were supposedly killed and four civilians injured. There's the strike at Banu, outside the tribal areas. And the newspapers in Pakistan went crazy. This is a cable from the US ambassador. According to the local press, the US strike in Banu marked the first such attack in the settled areas of the Northwest Frontier Province. The first strike within Pakistan proper, within what is considered mainland Pakistan. So you see now why it's so important that these strikes be confined to those strange, exceptional areas. And there's a long history as you go through the WikiLeaks cables of all sorts of close cooperation between the Pakistan military and the US military. Our working relationship is a bit different from our political relationship, says one Pakistan officer. It's a bit more productive. So whatever the governments say, and they know what's happening, there's very close coordination and cooperation on the ground, including using networks of spies and informers run by the Pakistan Intelligence Service who provide information to the Americans about likely targets. Some of those who hold high office in the tribal areas have recommended all sorts of tactics to the United States. Here's one of them. He suggested that the United States consider follow-on attacks immediately after an additional strike. So you send in your missile, you kill, I don't know, three, four, 30, 40 people. Your drone is on station, sending back video feeds. People rush in. You would, wouldn't you? To help, wouldn't you? The suggestion here is that when those people rush in to help, you strike again. Now that's illegal under international law, but nonetheless, that's the suggestion. And it comes not from the United States, which in fact accepted that suggestion. It's called double tap. It came from inside the administration of the Pakistan government. Now finally, what does this mean? People object to drone strikes because they think it turns war into a video game. This is one of the most famous objections, that these armed drones encourage a PlayStation mentality to killing. Now it's true, as I've shown you, that these drones rely on video feeds. You need the video feed to fly the thing, and you need the video to identify the target. But I don't think they turn any of this into a video game. Firstly, because as I've tried to show you, I imagine most of you have played video games, so you know that video games are not distancing. You're fully involved in what you're doing. You care about the outcome. That's why those Officers say they're not seven and a half thousand miles away in Nevada. They're 18 inches away, eye to screen. And in fact, when this man went to the CIA and said, I hear you have a PlayStation mentality, he was told that that was flatly not true. If you're flying an ordinary aircraft, you come in at incredibly high speed. You drop your bombs and you fly off again. You see nothing. You know nothing about the target. Here, he says, I can look at their faces. I watch them for hours. See these guys playing with their kids and wives. When I get them alone, I have no compunction about blowing them to bits. But I wouldn't touch them with civilians around. After the strike, I see the bodies being carried out of the house. I see the women weeping. That's not PlayStation, that's real. 
Now, it's true that the US Air Force uses video games as a recruiting device, and those video games include flying a drone. But I don't think that turns this into a video game. My worries about the use of these drones are rather different. Firstly, there is the question of law, whether these killings are legal. Because after all, the United States is killing people in Pakistan, but it's not at war with Pakistan. President Bush once said that the challenge the United States faces in the 21st century is how to conduct war in countries we're not at war with. And drones are a remarkably effective way of enabling people to carry out war in countries we're not at war with. But more than that, when people worry about the law, it means that everyone looks at Washington. And the newspapers in Washington are constantly trying to find out what the CIA is doing, what rules it's following, how many people are killed in these strikes. No one is looking at Pakistan and at the victims on the ground. Then, the United States counts the victims of its strikes in such a way that it minimizes civilian casualties. We're reportedly told, for example, here, that the United States carried out a strike, no civilian casualties. People go to the site on the ground and they see orphans and they count six civilian casualties in just one strike. The second reason this matters, and that concerns me, is that what we're seeing is another line on the map dissolving. It's no longer possible to separate the military carrying out its war in Afghanistan from the CIA. By the old standards, says one commentator, this, these attacks in Pakistan, would be viewed as a war. Why don't we call it a war? Is it because it's being run by the CIA, not the military? And that matters because the CIA is a civilian organization. It's not a military organization. But it's more complicated because who provides the drones to the CIA? The US Air Force. Who is it monitors and controls the flights on the great video screens? It's the US military's Combined Air Operations Center in Qatar. Where are the flights flown from? The United States Air Force Base at Creech in Nevada. And who flies them? Most of them are flown by US Air Force pilots. Directed by the CIA, Target lists drawn up by the CIA, but the military is intimately involved in the mission. And then my last and final point. These drones enable war to be carried out more or less anywhere without calling it a war. Human Rights Watch wrote to Obama to say that the idea that the whole world is a battle space is contrary to international law. So when you, Obama, say that we're fighting on a global battlefield, what does that mean? What's the legal definition? What are the rules that you're following? And that matters because we know that America's use of drones has spread from Iraq and Afghanistan, war zones, to Pakistan, to Yemen, to Somalia. American drones have also carried out targeted killings in the Philippines. And much more recently, drones have been spreading across sub-Saharan Africa, all of them controlled by the United States. Now that's partly what I mean by the everywhere war. Drones can be used to produce military violence anywhere in the world. 
And I've just been talking about the United States. I said early on that one of the attractions of drones is they're cheap. So many other countries have got them. I said that Israel is the largest exporter of drones in the world. This shows the major countries with armed and unarmed drones at present. Israel exports drones to 47 different states. What I've been describing is an everywhere war carried out by the United States. But what happens when China starts using them like that? When Russia starts using them like that? The everywhere war then truly does risk becoming everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitz, uh, for your really interesting uh, presentation on drones and new mode of war in today's world. Uh, we have some time for questions, for raising questions from all the audience. So please, if you have any questions, please raise them. Thank you for the presentation. I would have two questions. The first one uh, is the public discussion in the US among the citizens uh, on, on, on the usage of drones. And the other, what are the perspectives of uh, uh, doing business with drones? Thank you. Thank you. They're both good questions. I think for US politicians, the most important advantage of the drone is that so very few young American men and women are in the war zone. There are still some there because the aircraft have to be launched from Afghanistan to fly in Afghanistan, to fly in Pakistan. But also, you need people there to fly the aircraft up into the air and for it to land. You can't actually do that by satellite because the satellite imposes a two-second delay and that's too long. The aircraft would crash. So you need people in the war zone to maintain the aircraft, to service the aircraft, and to take off and land. But it's only 30, 40 people. You have hundreds and hundreds of people elsewhere. So there you have troops out of harm's way. And I think most of the American public much prefer to fight wars where everyone stays home. They don't want soldiers coming back in body bags. But what you're really asking is about the victims, I suspect. And there are two issues which emerge there. The first is that the United States government repeatedly insists that civilian casualties are kept to a minimum. And every time a strike is announced unofficially, the American public is always told that this is a senior, a high-level Al-Qaeda Taliban figure. That happens so often that you wonder how many senior, high-level Al-Qaeda or Taliban figures could be left. Um, but the most intense public debate came when one of the names on that list for targeted killing, Anwar al-Awlaki, was an American citizen. And by and large, the American public don't care if the American military or the CIA are killing citizens of other states. But for the United States president to authorize the killing of a US citizen somewhere in the world, anywhere in the world, and remember, to authorize it without trial, there may be a sort of legal process because lawyers are involved, um, but there was no trial. And we're talking about an American citizen here. That is what caused the concern. So I think 
for, not for everybody, but for most people, the anxiety is not about ordinary Pakistanis or Afghans, um, but it's about that one American citizen. And the thought that if Obama can do it once, he can do it twice, he can do it 200 times. The question about exporting is interesting. <clears throat> US companies want to export their technology. And of course, there are all sorts of restrictions on arms industries in the United States, exporting guns and missiles. Um, and there are very strict limits on the export of drones. And so the market is being um, absorbed by manufacturers in Israel and increasingly in Italy, in China, um, and eventually, I suspect, in Russia too. And so there's a, um, an argument going on at the moment about missed opportunities. And what we're talking about here, I should make it clear, are military drones because drones have lots of other purposes. I think people who object to drones, um, that's like objecting to a typewriter because Hitler used it to type Mein Kampf. Um, you can type many other things other than Mein Kampf, and you can use a drone for many things other than killing people. So after the uh, Fukushima disaster in Japan, Drones were used to fly around the reactor to provide video coverage of the damage. After the earthquake in Haiti, drones were used to provide instant coverage of the extent of the damage. Drones have been used, smaller ones, to track forest fires in California, to track herds of caribou in northern Canada. So there are all kinds of ways in which drones can, can be used which don't involve directly or indirectly killing. But still there are those restrictions on export from the United States. But you can buy toy drones and you can control them from your iPhone. Really. Um, yeah, um, uh, yeah. uh, I have a question uh, regarding your, um, your opinion uh, about a connection between Video games and uh, or with, between playing video games and uh, and uh, killing people and the drones, uh, don't you think that uh, uh, people by playing video games somehow tire or limit their desire to kill in a real world? Thank you. That's a really interesting thought. Um, let me try and work through that. First, I think that war today depends upon many of the skills that are developed by playing video games. That's to say that war today depends, for example, on hand-eye coordination, even more than it did in the past. It depends on really being able to look at a visual field and understand very, very fast what's happening within it. Secondly, the US military knows that the young people that it recruits now are members of a video game generation who have those skills and those qualities. But the study that people always talk to me about is a book called On Killing by Lieutenant Dave Grossman. A former military officer who carried out a whole series of studies and read very widely to show that by and large, most of us, whether we play video games or not, are reluctant to kill another human being. In other words, it's not human nature to be violent, to kill. But he argues in that book that one way in which you overcome that resistance is because he says video games distance you from what you're doing. It's just a game on the screen. And what I've tried to say is that video games don't distance you. If you were um, a pilot 
in a Lancaster bomber over Hamburg in 1943. You're flying at night. You have a very simple skeletal map of the city. You can't see anything except lights flickering below you. You don't know really what you're doing. But if you fast forward now to flying a predator or a reaper over Afghanistan, over Pakistan, I really do believe that you can see in horrible detail exactly what you're doing. So I think that for those who carry out these strikes, well, I've interviewed 12, 14 of them. I hear what you say, but not one of them plays a video game when they get home from work to relax. Because for them, video games are video rather is very serious. Um, but I think for many other people, yes. Um, you had Joanne Sharp here, yes, two years ago? Yes, Yeah. Well, I don't know if she told you this or not. But Joe, who is a brilliant feminist scholar working in the area of geopolitics, plays video games, violent video games. Um, we've talked about this often, and uh, she says that, you know, it doesn't make her more violent. And she actually once said to me, maybe it has the effect that, that you suggest, that playing them is a way of containing the rage. Uh, she didn't mention. I didn't think so. <laughs> Don't worry, your English will be much better than my Czech. <laughs> well, Derek, I will ask you. you raise the questions on, uh, on imagination, of, uh, which is somehow brought to, to us by drones. And uh, you are well known for uh, broadening the concept of Orientalism of Edward Said in your book, A Colonial Present and Others. Uh, so don't you think that uh, it is a kind of Orientalism, how our way of thinking and uh, visual, our imagining the uh, Middle East or the Afghanistan, that provide us uh, the legitimacy to attack them? Thank you. Yes, I do. Um, though I think it's, it's slightly complicated. Uh, can, can I go back to the video games to talk about that? Because um, you started this. But, um, you can buy lots of video games in which war is staged in the Middle East and you as the player are fighting in a city which may or may not be Baghdad but all the signs are in Arabic and some of the street names I actually recognize from Baghdad. And what's interesting when you play those games is that as you move down the street, checking from side to side, suddenly a figure appears and you know whether it's a terrorist or an insurgent because they've got a black mask and they're pointing a gun at you and they're firing it at you. So it's easy to detect who they are in all the games I've seen. But if you talk to people who've served in Baghdad, the challenge of counterinsurgency is that you, you can't because they the people you're fighting look like everybody else. And so Orientalism appears in two ways. It appears because in some of the cheaper, simpler video games, you have these cartoon figures that you're killing. But it appears secondly because when these wars are being fought, the population at large is produced as, as alien. Let me try to explain that more directly. Um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to go and talk to a conference on counterinsurgency. And this was army officers from Canada, from Britain, from the United States, and from France. And I said, you don't want me to come because you won't like what I'm going to say. And they said, no, we do want you to come because we have so many academics who come through 
They tell us what they think we want to know, and it's a waste of everyone's time. We promise to be nice. So I went. And what I said was that when you prepare troops to go to Iraq or to Afghanistan, well, five or six years ago, they were just the enemy. And you learned, particularly in Iraq, in the first couple of years, that you were fighting in a landscape, in a culture, which you knew nothing about. All your training had been to fight the Soviet Union. And you expected a conventional war with tanks coming through the Fulda Gap, and you'd be fighting people who were not very different from you. But here you are in Iraq, in Afghanistan, you're fighting people who don't wear uniforms, who don't have tanks, who fight very differently, and whose culture is obviously different. And so what you learned over two or three years was that you had to understand that culture and that landscape, often in very oriental ways. Um, but at least you understood some of the most important ways in which what people in America think is normal and rational is not what people elsewhere in the world think is normal and rational. And all of that's very good, except that what you haven't thought about are all the other ways in which people in Afghanistan and Pakistan are just like you. You're very good at saying how different they are. And of course, in all sorts of ways, they are. You know, I mean, Kabul is not Chicago. But there are all kinds of other ways in which you have things in common. And I showed them a blog written by uh, a newspaper reporter in which he said, you know, I've heard that Arabs are really strange. Because if you turn up at their house at midnight with 12 soldiers, blacked faces, you kick down the door, you rush in without warning, you pull everyone out of their beds, you search the women and the kids, you drag the men outside, you put hoods over their heads, you tie their hands behind their back, and you take them away in a helicopter for two months, and nobody knows where they've gone. And you bring them back two months later, covered with bruises, crying. You know, Arabs are so incredibly weird, they get angry at that. And that's the point, that, that Orientalism plays into this, because the US Army have taken the first step there are things that we have to understand about other cultures, things we have to respect because they do things differently. But there are also all sorts of other ways in which we, we have things in common. And that if you don't understand those, if you can't understand why someone turning up at your house in the middle of the night and kicking the door down would make anyone anywhere in the world angry, frightened, then the violence will just get worse and worse and worse. Now the thing about the drones though is that of course all you're seeing are images on the screen. You may feel as though you're there and remember Obama watching the, um, the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. I mean you did feel you were there because there were video cameras on the, the, the helmets of the soldiers and they were beamed back from a drone as it happens to the White House. But by and large, on the drone, all you can hear are the voices of other Americans. The people looking at the video screens in Qatar, the soldiers on the ground. So even though you feel you're there because of the quality of the video feed, all, everything you can hear, everything you're seeing on the chat room, means that what you 
recognize, what you identify with, are other Americans. Americans in harm's way. And you can't really read the landscape or, or the culture of the people. Um, very difficult to do from 20,000 feet or even from a couple of hundred feet. So Orientalism is still important, um, both on the ground and I think in the air. Sing a duet now. Um, I would like to ask you, in uh, in uh, relation to the discussion about the video games, and to what extent actually this is uh, uh, a video game or a real thing. You, we talked about uh, this a little bit during lunch, um, and you mentioned the importance of the tactile and the sound and being inside, even though perhaps. Uh, to mediated through technology, but still being in there. And um, we will have uh, another guest next week, um, Tim Ingold here. So I, I'd, li I'd like to, uh, you to th perhaps try to uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, let me take you back to a different place and a different time. I've just completed some work on the First World War. And I talked about this in London last week. What my research tries to show is that in the First World War, on the Western Front, every day, every week, maps and aerial photographs were being produced for the armies. The only way in which you could fight trench warfare was if you knew a great deal about the enemy. So aircraft flew every day over enemy lines with huge bulky cameras about this big, taking photograph after photograph after photograph. These were rushed back, maps were produced, the maps were sent to soldiers on the front line who would then write all over them and update them. So the maps are constantly in motion. The trenches might not move much, but the maps are constantly in motion. The generals who are planning the battles use those maps, use those aerial photographs to produce a plan which for most battles is 100 pages. At 9 o'clock this will happen. At 5 past 9 this will happen. At 10 past 9 this will happen for 100 pages. The maps are suddenly very, very elaborate so that, for example, the, the guns of the artillery will fire at this point on the map for five minutes. And the, the soldiers will come up behind them. And then, precisely at five past the hour, the guns will lift and they will fire to this point. And then the military will advance behind them. Now you put all of that together, and this is a war which depends upon the visual, upon the optical. And there are many military historians who've described the First World War as the first optical war. It's unusual because, you see, until then, generals fought. Generals went on to the battlefield. Or, riding their horse, they were on a hill just behind the battle and could see what was happening. In the First World War, Generals did not fight. They weren't on horses behind the front lines. They couldn't see what was happening. They were miles and miles away. And they depended upon the maps and the aerial photographs. And what I said was that if you think about the war in Afghanistan today, or in Pakistan, it's even more optical, visual, because it depends upon video feeds. It depends upon computer screens. It depends upon officers having digital devices in their hand. I mean, the iPhone has been used by the US military for years. But if you go back to the First World War and you read the letters and the diaries of those young soldiers, what you discover is that for them, the First World War wasn't about what you could see. Most of the time, it was about 
what you could hear, what you could smell, and what you could touch. It was about what you could hear, because when a battle started, the noise of the explosions and the shells meant that you had to know whether that shell was coming from the enemy to you, or from your guns to the enemy. You had to listen to the sound in order to understand the danger. Smell and touch, because so much of that war was fought in mud. But mud, which was made up not just of earth and water, but of shells, of ammunition and gunpowder, and of human bodies, body parts. And the only way you could survive, for the most part, wasn't by standing up, not even by ducking down, but by crawling, by using your whole body to understand this, not as a space on a map, but as something that you actually feel through your body. And you read these letters and these diaries, and all of these soldiers are saying, in different ways, that the most important knowledge they had in the First World War was not optical through the eyes, it wasn't the map or the aerial photograph, it was through the body. Now, go to Afghanistan. And the interviews I've done with veterans suggest that it's not so very different. Those organizing the war, controlling the war, see it on video screens. They see it on computer screens. They look at their iPhone. But for most of the soldiers out on patrol, for most of those suddenly caught up in a firefight with the Taliban, it's not long-range war, it's very, very close. Most US soldiers are killed within one mile of the enemy. 95%, in fact. And they say that the only way in which they can make sense of that battle space, it's not mud, it's a different physical medium. It's dust, and it's sand, and it's grit, and it's stone, and it's desert. But if they couldn't feel it, if they couldn't hear the noises, they couldn't make any sense of it. And the reason that matters, so to get back to Tim Ingold, is that once you start to think that war is optical, visual, once you start to think that in the 21st century, our wars have become so smart, so surgical, so precise, because we can use computer technology, we can use video feeds in such a precise way, what happens? Well, what happens is that for the public, not for those fighting the war, but for the public, war does look awfully like a video game. And a video game without real bodies. But you see, once you start to think about those who are doing the fighting, just as in the First World War, you're suddenly painfully aware that this isn't a video game, that it's not just fought by what you can see on the screen, but it's fought by bodies which bleed, which lose limbs, and which die. And politically, that seems to be extremely important, because unless we constantly remind ourselves that war is about killing, and if it's not about killing, it's about so destroying the human body. It can survive now because medicine has advanced in all kinds of extraordinary ways. So soldiers and civilians now survive wounds which even 10 years ago would have killed them. But they survive them with two artificial arms, two artificial limbs, with much of their body blown away. And if we don't understand that wars are about bodies, then I think it becomes much too easy to support wars, to start wars, rather than to stop them. If that helps.
Thank you for, for your answers. I think that we are at the end of this your lecture and the discussion. Thank you very much for really being here. Thank you for interesting uh, uh, questions. Thank you for very, very inspiration, for a big inspiration for the next, uh, next years. And hopefully in four years in Australia again. Oh, yeah, I'll be here whenever you want. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.